before we do get kind of cracking, let me just introduce our speakers. I'm going to start here with James Burke. James is the founder of Acrylicize, and he is, has been kind enough to let us host this in this fine venue tonight. I'm going to let him subliminally sort of uh, tell us more about this space as we go, rather than putting him on the spot and giving us a spiel Thank you. just now. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, James Burke. <laughs> And then over here we have Joel Turnbull. Joel has come all the way from the north. Uh, I'm not entirely sure which part of the north, but I have been told <laughs> it's the north. Uh, and Joel has a background in arts journalism. I've had a chance of reading a whole bunch of his articles. He's got some really interesting points. I'm going to put you on the spot. Some really interesting points regarding art and the wider world. So I can't wait to hear some more of his background. So ladies and gentlemen, Joel Turnbull. And then here on my right, we have Vestilia Chilton. Vestilia has had, she's really the driving force of bringing public art to the streets of Morocco, Marrakesh in particular with the Marrakesh Biennale. And now her sights are more focused here in Croydon. Something about the weather, I think, that brought her over here. <laughs> and yeah, ladies and gentlemen, Vestilia Chilton. And then over here we have an artist who sits just as comfortably in the walls of the National Portrait Gallery as he does in Lazaridis. Um, he has been part of an exhibition just over a decade ago now in Palestine um, with Banksy, Santa's Ghetto, and I can't wait to hear more about that. But he's also, you might be more likely to have seen his work through protests in the streets of London on placards with uh, sort of reworkings of cigarette packets and Donald Trump's face, ladies and gentlemen, Anthony Mikulik. <laughs> My name's Doug Gillen, by the way. Probably should have started with that. <laughs> so, Thanks, yeah, thank you, Tina. So I'm gonna get us going, uh, and I'm gonna keep this kind of open. You know, like I said, we are seeing um, bigger movements, bigger momentums, protests in the streets, um, and, and art is playing a big part of this. Is it okay to punch a Nazi? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone want to jump on this? Quick it's definitive a, answer. I want definitive yeah, answer. Yeah, I, I, yeah. This, tonight yeah. is not a night for fence sitting, by the way. Tonight you are making statements and you are going all in. <laughs> yeah, I'm for a firm yeah. action. Yeah, I would say so. Good. Well, <laughs> that's, that's that out of the way. <laughs> I didn't expect it to. Uh, what about yourself? Definitely. You? Okay. okay. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> I'll go around the board. I'm going to be happy to cut this throughout with sort of uh, questions to you guys as well. Because we're in an intimate environment here and it would be unfair for us just to sit here. So just give me a raise of hands. Does anyone here disagree with the idea that, you know, it's, it, we shouldn't be punching Nazis? I okay. disagree. That was my first response was no. It's not that I wouldn't want to, um, but I don't think I would actually think the most progressive way forward is to punch one. Okay, hopefully by the end of this, we'll have changed your mind. Um, <laughs> no, fair enough. Yeah, well, I think, I think there is always the, the, the platform. I mean, I think this is the first stage, sitting down, having conversation, I mean, opening up debate, but when... Always, you know, obviously the way to do it, isn't it? I mean, you don't want to, just because you disagree with someone, you don't want to go and punch them. But I mean, if you can do it in other ways where it challenges them and maybe find an, an, an answer to why they are a Nazi is a good way of getting around that. So if you can make a piece of art, maybe, but which can question or get them to talk to you, then that's a good thing, right? 100%. You might want to punch them afterwards, but... <laughs> I think that's the thing, that's the thing, that's where you get to. I mean, it is crazy. In 2017, this was a... 2016, this was a, a question that was going around the world, and you were just kind of like, in my, you know, entire time in this one, that's never been a, a thing I've, I've had to ask myself. And then, of course, you start seeing it happen, and you think, well... But, but when if you can punch them, and they obviously feel that like they can punch you, and then you're just going to get in a fight. So, you've got to have dialogue, right? That's yeah. how you break it down. It's, it's, I guess, it, 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 if you can get them into this, this, this platform, then it's great. So with, with regards to the, 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 um, the Trump facts, mm. do you want to maybe kind of describe a little bit more for those <coughs> that haven't seen the, the project? And I, what I really want to know is when you 
like kind of, I guess, came out with this political statement, you know, this kind of Trump kills. Um, what kind of <coughs> response and did you receive a backlash from that? Yeah, um, so originally, I think ideas kind of like ferment. They don't, I mean, sometimes they just pop into your head like a slide would do. Um, but originally how it started, um, I was, I used to paint my own portraits on the back of cigarette pack packets because I just, it just made me laugh. And it was silly and naive, and I used to do that. But um, and then I was asked to do something for a charity for Peace One Day, and I had the idea of doing Trump on a cigarette packet. And I thought that could go quite well. And like obviously the Marlboro packet is quite sort of stylistic. Um, it's kind of an icon in its own sense of that real American brand. And then Trump himself looks like I've always thought he looks a bit like a Simpsons character. You know, like a yellow Cheeto dust head with like a yellow wig put that on the cigarette packet and then I, I just when you mix language like that it's quite interesting it changes the dynamic of of not only the cigarette packet but also a trump so putting that together was fun so I decided to 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 give that to the charity and it was I thought it was interesting it's called peace one day and you hand over a picture of trump you know um so that's how that started um, I, I guess in terms of a backlash, I, in the beginning, yes, I think I had, you know, it's funny, you get, you get, people get really angry and they get quite aggressive. I mean, you just think, God, would I behave like that? So if I saw an image I disagreed with, um, but then, you know, and people, you know, they, they, they start saying, well, why didn't you paint Obama on the packet? You know, and not that I've agreed with everything that Obama does, but you can't paint everyone you dislike on the back of a cigarette packet, full-time job. Um, so I... Yeah, you can try. Yeah. Like, you know, sure about every sure potato.com or something. I don't know, but um, yeah, so there was a backlash and I think all my kind of um, Trump supporters kind of eventually migrated and left, really. So I guess this, is, this then becomes I, the problem now online it's very easy to just dismiss when you see you know you find out that an artist you like is is a, this way leaning and then you just go around well you're done I'll, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll do something else if you if you see a, a magazine or a, a, a publication that you follow online it's very easy to just uh, dismiss them and then kind of delete them from your your vision, and this is kind of, I guess, how we ended up with this, this, this equity, but as a journalist, uh, Joe, have you, you sort of seen anything on this side? Do you find that you get much backlash um, when you're making statements regarding uh, street art? Certainly, uh, in the, the Guardian comments are a strange place to inhabit. Uh, I've had physical threats of violence uh, about a piece I wrote about whether Facebook is making us more vain, um, which I think it is. Um, but yeah, the idea of the echo chamber is quite an interesting one. Um, it's just, we're all talking to ourselves. We're all sort of encasing ourselves with voices that we only listen to. And I think that is a problem. Um, but in an online space, I've, I think there's some research which says basically when you're on the internet, it's the equivalent of having two pints of beer. Um, you're that much less inhibited. Uh, and so, you know, people say stuff that they don't really mean. And so I don't think it's really valuable to just go to, if someone says a statement that you disagree with, to kind of write them off uh, entirely. And so I kind of think you should try and engage that. And also I think platforms like Twitter aren't really the best thing for that. I mean, I've occasionally got into debates about things like Hegelian dialectics on Twitter and 140 characters really isn't enough to <laughs> kind of just, and so what happens is that it kind of breaks down and and you you can't have a dialogue and so I think that's also a, an argument for coming out of the online space actually and and, and, physi and yeah and, and physical, physically interacting physi sometimes yeah. I mean I think they're great tools but I think increasingly they're looking like kind of broken tools. How do you think we combat that echo chamber? As, as, uh, 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 as uh, I, I think the danger with, say, social media in that sense, in that context, of people dip in and they dip out when, it, when they choose, and we all do that to an extent. So I, I think a lot of news is taken out of context, and, and so we just get snippets, and especially like you talk about the echo chamber, Facebook, our own feeds. We're always showing the bits we want to show other people, you know? And 
And when that's all going around, it gets, there's a lot of noise around. It's really hard to focus or even, like you say, have a proper art, well, debate mm -hmm. where like this is good because then you can say something, we can take turns and it, it gets properly kind of investigated in a sense, so, which is a good way of dealing with it, I guess. We do need a Piers Morgan or like a Richard Spencer leading figure from the the alt right just to sit there and just <laughs> completely contradict absolutely everything that comes out. Um, just a minute. So, with regards to sort of public art, um, you are very involved in the sort of the mural world. Do you think murals and mural festivals, particularly, can have the same impact that you would see from unsanctioned, uncommissioned, kind of, I guess, what you would call more organic street art? Do you think there is a, a, a place? for it to have that same message? Such a good question. To be honest, um, you know, if we look at street art history, look, look at Ireland, for example, there's more than 2,000 murals painted there. They were all politically charged. So actually, street art it has been used to say something that what the people feel. So it's anti-establishment most of the way. It's freedom of speech. And the, the, the good news about that is that if you don't like the mural, it's disappeared. You know, within two days, it's gone if somebody disagrees with it. So in, in that sense, it has a real sense of freedom and real freedom of speech. Um, but, you know, the project that we did in Morocco, we, we, we didn't rebel against the, the regime. The, the, there was the opposite of that. So most of the time the murals would go up um, illegally, whereas here we asked the government and the local people to paint the murals. And what we were trying to say is acceptance, tolerance, unity. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a completely different message. So I think with mural festivals, you're, you're sort of borderline... Um, trying to show a place, to describe a place, describe the people, and show some form of tolerance. Um, whereas the anti-establishment street art tends to be, you know, the forbidden words, the the forbidden message that they're trying to convey. What, when you say the sort of the forbidden words, can you elaborate on? Well, on I that think it was more? it was quite interesting. The punch, the the gentleman said, you know, punch. You, you said actually, would you punch a Nazi in the face? Actually, it's a really difficult concept. I mean, you don't particularly if you're a humanist. A humanitarian person, you don't want to be punching people around. So it was a very valid point. On the other hand, I wanted to say you can punch them with a bit of art because art has this ability to communicate without words. And when words are too com uh, too controversial and too difficult to express or forbidden, in the sense like, for example, non nonconformists in the Russian state. I know an artist who was uh, surveyed by KGB and he, they would turn up at their house with under gunpoint and say, does this green represent communism? I mean, this is the moment where you can't speak what you want to say, so you use art to convey your message. Mm -hmm. So that's... that's um, uh, I would agree. I think that art has the amazing ability to distill the chatter, the noise, the rhetoric down into something that is bite-sized, manageable and, you know, can, can get a message across so much more distinctly than you know all the noise that's going around so it has an amazing ability and power to do that yeah but exactly in order for <clears throat> that message to be conveyed there has i mean you look on instagram now, and i'll look at a piece of art for for two seconds you know i'll, I'll scan i'll scan and it, i i have to be immediately captured by something to to rest on that for any length of time yeah um so that that in itself yeah, makes I think it harder for that for that message to denoise. The, the challenge is greater to just cut through the just the sheer amount of content that there is, and that's kind of I guess the challenge for an artist is in the world that we live in now is to kind of get that point out there in a way that you can really effectively capture people's attention. Because you know, I mean, I spend so much time just wasting my time on Instagram, and it's just like I've achieved nothing from doing that. But you know, the one thing that stands out and. I guess the ability with social media for stuff to get shared and to, to gain traction in a way that just couldn't possibly in previous generations. And if you can hit that sweet spot, then mm. it's incredibly powerful. Any yeah. advice on the sweet spot? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not a question I thought I was going to ask. No, I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying completely. I just think, um, as you said, art has the ability just to still, I guess, a conversation. And I think it can really resonate and get to that point just there. And it can, I think you begin to think, when art really works, you begin to sort of think with emotion, if that makes sense, or you, it, just, yeah. it just gets straight to the point. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, it's really hard to articulate things and art has a great power of just saying things, but also with empathy from both sides, which can be great. So, I mean, I think the, the role of the viewer is absolutely crucial to complete the story. Mm. So, you know, you can put something out there which, you know, for me, it's about 
questions more than answers and then you know it's it's yeah, yeah. to complete the circle the viewer makes his interpretation and you, you, you know, must get that a lot um when you've made something and someone says oh well he's doing this here and you just think was i what, was was i didn't see that coming but well we had, valid. we had this incredible moment um in london we brought this uh, quite controversial political artist mia one to London, and he painted this uh, paint a mural in Brick I Lane. I filmed that. You filmed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I filmed that. The one, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he was arrested. There's a video for on it. YouTube you can check out. Yeah. Wall TV, quick plug. Yeah. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. Well, and it was it was completely innocently painted in the sense that it wasn't really the message was anti-capitalist. You know, too many people have power. It was a monopoly <clears> board held up by what looked like slaves, which is not normal people like us. Basically, we are the slaves, and the monopoly board being played some of the powerful bankers, the Rothschild family, and so forth. And what was interesting, it didn't look very dangerous. I mean, it looked like a really beautiful mural, and a lot of people really liked it. And of course, Brick Lane is very international. You have, you know, you have the Arabs living there, the Jewish living there. Everything is mixed up. And um, the only people we didn't expect to have a backlash from was the Jewish community, who basically said it was anti, uh, you know, anti-Jewish because it was... Um, anti-Semitic, actually, that's the right word, but um, because some of the noses were too big, so it was almost caricatures of the Nazis on the Nazi period. So we were basically threatened, and the police came around and said we were going to evict you from the country because this is too dangerous. And there was a huge petition from the Tower Hamlets being signed. It was on <coughs> BBC News. I mean, I love the TV the way it was done with BBC because it was re representing both sides. They went round the local people and asked for. Op opinions, which most people said in Brick Lane would love it. It's fantastic. It's really pro us. It's about you know human human race. But then the other side was, oh, it's horrible. It's really hot. Why are we bringing back the Nazi, the Second World War, you know, caricatures? So it was presented in that way. But on the other hand, we had to buff it. For me, for me, I find that really funny that you said that because that was one of the last pieces I really remember. Also, one of the first pieces I really remember that, that I saw in this area that just that just stalked me dead, floored me. Because, you know, here specifically, there is so much of that noise and it is impossible almost. You know, you could be standing there painting something like that, but even, you know, that was what, five years ago? Yeah. And, and now it's built up here so much that you could have something that had maybe necessarily the same image, but because there's so much other stuff, that message is somewhat diluted. Yeah. Well, you can't bit. please everybody, but the good thing is that it did get people talking. That was quite interesting. In the fact, you know, with street art, is one of the things that it doesn't live forever. You know, it was there for a minute, and the social media carries it forward. It makes it mm. live for longer than it, it's, it's supposed to, sort of posted expiry date. So, you know, without social media, I think street art wouldn't have had this massive phenomenon. A lot of people say it's responsible for that. Because once you've painted a mural, it goes on and lives on this virtual world, and then mm. more people can see it. Um, from the screens of their house, basically. Joe, so one of the points I read in, in one of your articles was that Banksy's success has somewhat hindered his ability to make a political statement. Um, I, I didn't see the date on that. Do you still, in fact, it was actually, it must have been last year, because it was yeah, after, after the Calais one, yeah. so it must have been relatively recently. Um, can you maybe elaborate on that idea, and do you still 100% believe that his success has stopped him from being able to make a political statement. In a sense, yeah, Banksy's very much trapped that if he put, if he makes uh, if he puts a piece up and it's making a political statement, very quickly it'll be often taken down by the people who own the building because they want to capitalize on it, sell it. Um, uh, it becomes this uh, this thing, and there was a huge so that particular piece. Um, basically, uh, Banksy did a piece on uh, the French Embassy in London. Uh, protesting about uh, the clearing of the Calais jungle and it was quite an innovative piece in a way that, that it had uh, someone being attacked by tear gas and it, it was what it depicted uh, and it had a QR code which actually took you to a video of riot police in France using uh, tear gas to clear the Calais jungle um, but then it was boarded up within a few days by the people who owned the building it's ostensibly to protect it but really because they wanted to cash in on it. Um, so obviously that's difficult for Banksy. He wants to make a public piece of art, which is for everyone. He's putting it in, that's why he's doing that. Uh, and then that commercial aspect is kind of a counter to that. Uh, so there's also, there's a street artist called Blue from Italy. Um, 
there was a show in Bologna, I think, in 2015 called Banksy and Co. Uh, that they were putting on in Bologna, uh, and it was a collection of murals that had been painted by street artists that had been taken from their original places and put into this exhibition. Uh, and Blue, this street artist in Italy, was pretty pissed off about that. He was saying, well, it's giving quite a counter message. People are criminalised for doing street art if it's not done with permission, and yet you're kind of commercialising it in this respect. So what he did, because they wanted to take some of his art and put it into it, is he basically dubbed over all his own art in that city. So he went and painted all his own artwork. He loves that, doesn't he? He did that in Berlin. Yeah, as well. in Berlin, because they wanted. To, so that's another great, great example of that. In 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 a, in a district of Berlin, mm -hmm. uh, they it's one of the most it was one of the most famous pieces of uh, street art in Berlin there, uh, and it was in an area that had been poor and had a lot of empty spaces previously. And some developers threw up some luxury flats, and they had a lovely view of this famous piece of street art by Blue, and they were using that in the marketing material as a selling point of the, of the flats. Mm -hmm. And so Blue basically heard about this, got on the phone to some of his friends in Berlin, and basically said, just paint over it. Uh, so a group of street artists from Berlin went and painted over. Do you think that's, the, that's, that's that kind of, a, I guess, the term was used earlier, affirmative action, you know, that's pretty much as as you know affirmative as it gets the, the definition of, of, of reclaiming space do you think that's essential to 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 maintain uh, i guess a degree of um integrity i I, I i do i mean i think that street art and graffiti culture they're, they're kind of born out of a desire to reclaim public space from creeping commercialization um and i think that's a really relevant conversation to be having now when um you know Trump is in the process of transforming the most public institution of all, the government, so that it resembles a business. Uh, well, he's cutting art funding. Yeah, well. and he's oh, that's gone. Forget that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the no, no way for that anymore. <laughs> yeah. No. That's, a, that's a healthcare. That's a free healthcare that's gone. But I think we're also talking about the art market, which I see as a completely kind of separate animal. People make art, and that's the really beautiful thing. And, and then there's the art market, which, you know, Oh, it's a, it's a thing that comes yeah. along and, like you said, and cuts paintings out of walls and sticks it, you know, in, in an exhibition space. Um, and that's how do you feel he should? I mean, not exactly not to put words in, 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 in how he should do things, but how do you think can he go anywhere else from that, or is it now just should the baton be passed and should other people be be sort of taking on from that? Because I feel like he's tried to pass the baton a few times with regards to the street stuff. I, I just I don't think I mean you know I think I think he probably really enjoys putting his work out there and it's a shame if he can't do that just because of his success I mean you know just I, I don't think anyone would want to see that as well so just because you get I mean he's incredibly famous so he gets to this point and you can't make art I mean it's it's a question we have to talk about ourselves like stop stealing art rather than stop making no, art no no that'd be a good one to fix how do we do that. Stop How stealing. do we stop? Stop people stealing banksies. Well, there was this. I, I was watching a documentary about um, uh, Tracy Emin, and she was she's a great public speaker, by the way. You shouldn't invite her to speak. <laughs> she's great, but she was talking. She did a bird project, and she created these birds, and she put them in Liverpool. And of course, it was paid by the Liverpool Council. So there's a sort of council, obviously belongs to the people. Um, and somebody stole one. And so she put out a newsletter and then went into the press and everything. Can you give it back? It's not, yeah. you, it's not mine. And it was returned within a day. I, th I think she lost yeah. her cat and made notes and <laughs> someone was stealing them. So <laughs> steal everything and they, can, they make a bit of money. So, yeah, so you know, can't trust, that, can't be trusted. That's not the reason why someone should stop making art. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Are you wary of inviting people around to your studio? What, so they still get to <laughs> no, 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 like walking out with canvases, just like, you know, just annoying things like the tips of brushes. Well, I kick around your house and steal <laughs> bits from your, I don't know. I mean, that's just, just called being really really a cool cool feet. That's just that. <laughs> that's just <laughs> that's <laughs> straight up. Yeah, yeah. Don't steal from people's houses. <laughs> Well, it's, it's easy for us to say, but people are happily doing it. There was the, there yeah, was but, yeah, but you, could, you could live in a, like, you could have a place like Donald Trump's house that's full of gold, and I could steal your cigarette ashtray. 
I could, I could still, I'm thinking, you could just steal things. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just steal everything. That's what we're taking, that's what we're going to take it away from. But I think I'm right in saying that Banksy won't authenticate any of his street stuff yeah, to yeah. protect himself Same from... Same with Invader gets that yeah. a lot as well. Yeah. Everybody's after it. And it's kind of a safeguard I mean, I for think, the secondary market. I think Banksy gets around it, and he works under a lot of pseudonyms. I don't think, I don't, you know, I think a lot of stuff is Banksy that's not necessarily attributed to him as well. Mm. So that's one way. I mean, I he's, way he's, to, he's yeah. done pretty well at maintaining his anonymity, really, c- mm. given what a massive figure he is. But it just goes to show you can do that if you have the resources <clears throat> and you can well, be able to put Dismaland without without any any. Do you think they care? I mean, the Daily Mail ran the pictures years ago, and um, you know that that was kind of almost one hundred percent confirmed. You know, the Daily Mail posted these pictures, and everybody just went, mm. so who cares? Who cares that he's just some dude? It's more person. fun not knowing. I think people yeah, are just yeah. kind of like the idea that, you know, I'm not going to know what he looks yeah. like. You know, that's, it's better that way. Speaking of the big man, we'll move on from him. Going to get back on, on track. You were, you were part of that um, Santa's Ghetto project. Was that 2006? Uh, 2000, late 2007. Okay. Well, it was 10 years ago anyway. Yeah, so yeah. this was uh, an exhibition that Banksy had, had, had thrown and you were invited to host, uh, to show some work. With this, and it was in Jerusalem? Uh, so it was in Manger Square, uh, which is just behind the separation wall. Um, I mean, I, I don't paint on walls, because I, I can't. And I paint in oil, so it'd be a mess. Um, so I, you know, we, like a lot of artists, with, like insects are there, like the Fail Boys. Um, Peter Kennard, he's great. Um, really huge political artist. Um, and so, like, I think everyone just did their own little bit, which is really nice. Um, and those guys painted on the walls. I went to like a scrap heap and found bits of metal and painted on that. And anyway, but we had a, like a joint exhibition in Major Square, and there were people from all around the world there, and that felt really nice. And I just thought it was really, I just thought it was really great because you know I'm there and I, I, I play with crayons for a living, and I get invited to this place, which is really great. <coughs> um, and I got to see you know stuff and talk to people, get people's opinions. Um, and it just felt, it, it just felt really nice because it just wasn't a commercial sort of <coughs> venue in that sense. It wasn't, you know, it was, I think we were just trying to show people art which don't normally get to see art. And also it's so flattering, like lots of people came from this different parts of the world to, you know, to go and see the art. But I was very aware that, you know, we're in this place, but I'm a tourist here, you know, and I, you know, obviously these people struggle their daily lives and stuff, and um, you know, you just turn up, make make your art, then leave. So, but I think, I think if you make art in that sense, um, I think art, you know, a bit like we were talking earlier. Like, if you can talk about both sides of the situation and sort of, you know, have empathy for the situation in a sense, or you know, emotionally, because people are hurt on both sides, we can talk about that, rather than me just going there and going, I'm blaming you, and I'm blaming you, and, you know, I just think that's, a, to have a more of a sensitive approach is, is a good thing sometimes. Did you get any kind of, uh, any reactions from people there that maybe had taken something wrong? I mean, because it is so volatile. I, 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 so I, I, yeah, I didn't personally with my art, but I think other artists did. Um, and, and do you think, um, because Banksy has gone back to the Palestine case a lot, mm. um, and do you think that can still have an impact there? And do you really? I mean, yeah, that massively. Because see, people look at it. You know, it's like when a I don't know a certain celebrity or someone who's very well known points out something. A lot of people look at it and you know and question why. And so, in that respect. It's a good thing because it gets us talking about it. Mm-hmm. It was actually the wall. It was Wall and Peace that, that, that first got me, drew attention for me to that to that whole case. And I, but the thing is, because he followed that through with an exhibition, and then it, it generated something like what half a million dollars or something like that for for a local arts um, section department in a in a university. I think it was it was something like that. Um, and that was a follow through, but then what you're seeing on the other side, I guess, if you look at, say, someone just going in and painting on the partition wall now, mm. you know, because that is now covered in paint, can mm. that still draw an impact to the way that it, it can, do you think? I, I, th- I think it's important to make an impact to be organised. I think that's a really crucial part of, if we're talking about art and, and 
protest and kind of trying to generate changes, not just having the ability to make the work, but actually mm. make the work work. And so to do initiatives that galvanise people, and, and I think you just need to be organised. I think artists as brands, I think, are, are becoming more self-aware that they have power, the same way that brands have power. And, you know, you've only got to look at the advertising industry as a way to very effectively get a message to affect change. And I think that we're all so influenced by that in our culture, in this capitalist culture that we're in, that I think we're able to, we're savvy to that, and we're able to take elements of that and use them to our own advantage. So I think a really important aspect of this whole story in terms of the artist's role in protest, politics, whatever you want to call it, is being organised, being savvy to generating change and getting people talking and, and bringing people together and organising events because I don't think it works just to have one element of it. You've kind of got to bring those, bring that world together. Do you see yeah. any examples of that happening specifically here in London? Yeah. I'm kind of using this as a platform for you to bring up this space. Oh yeah, this space. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so that's yeah. I mean, that's what this space is for. Yeah, well, um, yeah so we, we kind of basically, we took this space and uh, because I have a studio next door that's, that we're making work and um, this space came available and it was just such a beautiful space. And But we wanted to kind of create a bit of a hub and a bit of a community and I think that it's really difficult to be an artist and it's really difficult to kind of get out there and, and meet people. And I think we were talking about the internet age and social media, it's so important to be face to face and to, to interact with people and to bring people together. So we've kind of given this space as a community space. And so a, a night like tonight is the perfect example of that. This is a completely free event and it's just there to celebrate artistic pursuit and artistic practice. And this area is so renowned for that. And the more that we can bring people in and inspire each other and create dialogue and do good stuff together you know it's it's incredibly invigorating and it's incredibly rewarding and um yes yeah, it's, it's, how, it's how, what's the longevity of that here i mean this is the one thing especially at london events the one thing that everyone always falls back on is how do you you know how do you fight back against what is really happening here faster than ever and that's the rising prices you know studio spaces are becoming completely unaffordable housing is becoming unaffordable and there's not an offset for of support coming from 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 groups and, and, and organisations, can is there still a place for this kind of raw grassroots movement movement in shortage? But it's undoubtedly moving out, and you know it's just it's just a housing. So no, it's 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 a housing. I think the landlords <laughs> yeah. somehow have to really understand that this is you know this is culture what draws people in, isn't it? Right. So I mean, like you know, it's funny when uh, as everything. Progress well, not progressive, but spreads out like culture draws you in. Art, well, art, for example, like so. I guess if you're having conversations like this and you attract enough people, then if the landlord's got any sense, and well, this is great, more people are coming to my venues and stuff. So but it's but unfortunately, it's, it's pure greed, that yeah. Is, yeah, I mean, that's the motivation. It's, it's, it's unstoppable, it's, it's really what, difficult. Yeah. Yeah. What are you seeing in, in Croydon? Um, same thing. Sorry, I can't really defend it. I feel really passionately about it. You know, there, there, there is a problem, a really serious problem. You know, um, it's quite what everybody knows. Artists move in into a really bad area, also gays. You know, they tend to be quite popular around that. So then, the yeah, exactly, you know. Um, and then suddenly the property prices go up and then the, the, the most interesting people suddenly move away. But what I'm seeing, actually, because um, I've been following this quite closely, is that there's lots of developments, like, for example, in Margate, and outside of London, like Hastings, where they've come up with different formulas to build housing, where the developers are actually getting revenue from rents, um, but they rent to creative people. So they're not really interested in buying and selling. So it's a slightly different model. Um, they're interested in keeping the people renting them for, for as long as possible. So that's quite interesting. So that way, it kind of makes everyone stay in the community. They try to mix it up. Actually, there's been lots of studies done that if you've got an international um, community, the more international it is, the more money it generates. So it's actually quite good for, for the economy to have as many different varieties of people living in one place. Good thing we just had Brexit. Mm. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, sort, of, <laughs> sort of that right. What kind of north one are you seeing up, uh, up in, in, in the north? Well, I mean, obviously, I, I, it's, there's totally different challenges there. So that, in in effect, there's actually a lot of opportunity in that there's lots of empty spaces. You know, uh, most high streets in most northern towns 
have empty shop units and there's blocks of flats that are empty and that is an opportunity so I would sort of say yeah it doesn't all have to centre around London if you can't do it in London there is the opportunity to do that in places like Newcastle and Glasgow and Liverpool and Manchester and even smaller places than that but if you, there is the potential there to and also councils are very open there to, to groups coming with a proposal and saying look we'll do this to this space uh, and there's you know there's not necessarily long term security but you can certainly secure a space for a short amount of time often for free uh, I'm going to open up next hour conference will be up there Joe where's it going? <laughs> so I'm going to open up. Does anybody have anything that they would like to ask? Because we've talked for at least half an hour there. Does anybody have anything that they would like to chip in, statements? Just do me a favour, because uh, we've done this before, the last one, and people like to just stand up and they'll just talk about their project for 10 minutes. Mm. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Ready? So I'm currently working on that. Yeah. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> so you get a bit sheepish when I say that. When you, when you were talking about um, social media and, and how it's there's too much and it's a white noise, and yeah, we all, we all agree it's a white noise, but part of me is so happy we have this, this happy white noise because 10 years ago, most people consumed art on biscuit tins or going to the tape, and that was it. And now, so many people who don't go to galleries or don't buy biscuits anymore can consume art on their mobiles and their pads, iPads or whatever. Mm. And I think that we're very lucky with that. I know it's slightly abused by some people. I know, you know, there's no quality control over it. It's, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing that you can just switch on and go, wow, that's there. Do you think it, this is mm. then kind of challenging any form of elitism that was going around the art world? Do you think this is now kind of I like more... The more the merrier, everyone coming I and getting involved, and it doesn't. Be, I think, I think, zero point zero point one percent of it gets through to the art world. I think they don't know that most of it exists. Then you, myself, Anthony, Joe, we do. I think they're quite jealous of it sometimes, like you the art world. So? Yeah, I think they'd love to have the amount of followers, what street artists have, and all that. But people don't want to look at. I love the pile of bricks and Tate Modern, but some people don't want to, that doesn't look very good on Instagram. You know what I mean? It is interesting. It's like, I know artists that are huge like Donald in the Judge. Art world. And they, you know, compared to you or myself or numerous artists that I can mention, their um, access to public is, is tiny. Yeah. It's minute. Do you ever follow, anyone follow Lush? Anyone follow yeah. Lush? Yeah. Jesus. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's do you think it's possible? Because um, I mean, for yourself, you, you don't paint on the street, um, and this is kind of twofold. Do you think it's possible to have a successful art career? I mean, not. <laughs> for for new kids coming up to not paint on the street, and the second one is that for them not to paint on the street and for them not to engage in social media, is it possible to become anything unless you play that game? Well, I, I think. You know, your medium is just your medium, whether you paint indoors, you paint outside, you play guitar, or you, you do whatever. Social media is a tool which you can use to your benefit. You could live in Nigeria and someone in New York could see you and snap you up, you could be in a gallery, which is great. Never used to happen. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of noise, but I think if you learn your craft, whatever that may be, hopefully someone might spot you. So. It, just, it doesn't come easy becoming an artist. You've got to work and work and work and work and work and work again. And then it takes years. So you just got to build it up. But I, I, tools like that are handy because people, you can be seen, hopefully, somewhere. With regards to this need for being seen, which, which definitely exists on, on these feeds, do you see, is there any examples of people that you see really nailing this kind of engaging activist, kind of, I'm going to change the world aspect of art? Mm. On social media, I don't know. I I find, I think it's problematic if every artist is making their art, thinking what it's going to look like on social media. Like for me, I find that that's hugely restrictive to what kind of art you're going to make. Yeah. And I just I don't know. I I'm not a huge fan of art that just looks good <coughs> on the internet. I I still want to engage in the moment and in the present yeah. with it. I, I, and I, I think I think it would be awful if if every new artist coming up thought, oh well. I, my practice is all about 
how many followers I've got on yeah, Twitter, just, how good my Instagram wrong. game is, like what yeah, I can I do agree. on Facebook. I just think I, that I, means that, you just want to be a celebrity. Yeah, you just want to be famous for the sake of it. Your art is what everyone's interested in. Your art, really. I mean, you know, the artist is someone who just makes it. So, but it's your art. You know, if you can still go to the National Gallery, look at these Caravaggios. They're still doing their job now. You know, these guys are dead, being, you know, but it's still relevant. And that's because the art speaks, you know. And I think, I think my, my concern is that people become too passive and not active enough because you're consuming, you're consuming, you're consuming, you're spending so much time doing this. And you see kids and they are literally glued to their phones. There is like no looking up anymore at all, you know. And that's all time you could be spent doing stuff and practicing and building a trade and craft and learning stuff. So I've got young kids and my concern is that they spend so much time on social media they forget to do stuff you know it's like a real it's a real danger you know like I play the drums and like that's a craft that I sit and practice on and learn and I'm not on a screen and I'm not just watching what other people are doing I'm doing something for myself and I think it's so critical that this next generation engage in stuff offline because you know yes you can share it online once you've done it but you've actually got to do it first mm. And not just have that that mass. Not just game. watch what everyone We're else is doing. We're all having a good time here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's the picture. Um, do, how do you see the future of this? Then is it, it is is the inevitable X factor generation coming through? Have you already seen it start to emerge? You know, I mean, if you look at the same discussion that we're having here could be had with, with, with music, you know. There is always going to be the greats, the dead, and, and the guys that have shaped this. But there is this new platform of people that solely want to go through the machine, that want to be pumped onto X Factor, that, that want to then get that but It's all to education though, isn't it? Because like, that's the trouble now, if they're cutting arts funding, then you, no one can learn art or like the history of art or where it <clears> came from. And then if you've got no one with that kind of grounding, then how can you, like the art you make, you could be making the same thing someone else made. So it's all about education. <coughs> You know, the sad thing is about like X Factor and stuff. It's about being a celebrity. It's not about learning your craft, like, you know, we were discussing. And that's, that's what needs to be addressed. It's not, yeah. it's, you know. It's getting to the end result without actually yeah. doing the thing that I mean, gets all, you there. All the great artists I'm sure you love, and it's the same with all your musicians, the people who love what they do, love what they're making. You know, I don't think yeah. Tom York wanted to be a celebrity, but he's an amazing musician, you know, he's a celebrity it's, it's, now, it's, but... It's, it's, it's creativity is process-driven, and yeah, that yeah, process and is so critical. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I've, I've, and that's the important part. I really think the whole rise in artist as brand is just, is quite damaging. It, mm. uh, if artists are spending more time thinking about their brand, and how on-brand their next piece of work is, it's, just, it's like, how are they going to innovate? Like, do you they, think that, um, that you there's sustainability within those big names? I'm not going to start naming names, but there is, there's a, especially within the street scene, there is a collective of, you know, those guys that you'll see at every single festival, there's 10, ten people <coughs> painting the wall, and, you know, it's like, I've seen this yeah, it's the same 100 shit. times It's the same before. shit, they oh, don't oh, innovate. That's it's, the image. It's, it's exactly. That's is the there longevity yeah. in any, that? Any idiot can make an image. Yeah. Like, you know, it's a whole different conversation. Yeah. <laughs> But I think a lot. I think a lot of artists certainly coming up are kind of keyed into that and into the that. But that's the thing, you know. They get they brand. get lucky with one thing and they get I'm just going to hammer. Well, they just hammer it. Yeah. So I die. Yeah, and <laughs> also it's it's if it's we've got, we've got yeah. them. question here in the coach, my man. It's just a point, really. I mean, it's just on the back of uh, what Joe was saying. Um, I, I was at a talk the other day with uh, and Stick was was talking actually. It was precisely about the subject about you know, whether art should be a brand and you know, vice versa. And he, he just made this comment which just really hit home, which was that throughout all of the pieces that he's done, he never wanted to sign his pieces. He didn't want people to go, oh, that's a stick. Obviously, we know it is. But he wanted people to look at it and go, oh, that's two people holding hands. You know, and I think that's just really, really important. Um, mm -hmm. Especially, you know, using social media and kind of using it as a platform and constantly I and mean, I know when I'm in the studio that I have to kind of pull myself back from some from kind of incrementally checking, you know, what I've been doing and you know, what the reaction is. Um, because, yeah, you are using it as a tool do you, to, do you to feel get a reaction. But this it's is just something that really hit home. Because I guess for, for really anyone that, uh, that, that is, regards themselves as an artist, do you feel that if you don't get as many likes 
on a piece that you've put out that it's not as good as something that got more, even though your emotional connection might be completely different to it. Um, I, I, I guess, uh, actually, I'm just going to open this up because we've probably got a few artists. Do we have, uh, put your hand up if you feel that a piece that doesn't get as many likes, I, I, I can't imagine this is going to go well, uh, <laughs> doesn't get as many likes. I've, I've started it. We're halfway through this. I want you to be honest. If you don't get as many likes on a piece that you've posted, then it's not good. I'm hand here again. It's not as good. At times. At yeah, times. Well, See, if you're being honest, not, like, if you're being honest, yeah. no, maybe not. Well, there's oh. this wonderful thing, I mentioned it to Anthony, I was actually listening to another artist talking about, um, one, one point he was saying, like, you have to have a certain element of seriousness. And it was actually Grace and Perry, and it was like, you know, I dress like a clown, but am I a serious artist? It was sort of, you know, you have to sort of think about how serious you are about your subject and about your art. And the other thing he was kind of, clear, you know, debating was, that democracy is weak, and that's quite a political statement. And in itself, we can talk about politics and democracy, but in this case, his statement was um, they've done a study they um, across lots of different countries, and they asked the people to vote for their favourite artworks or similar thing, like what would your best artworks be, and it was inevitably a landscape. So, you know, so you know, being popularist or being popular is actually dangerous for an artist. So you have to be completely outside of the box, always trying to do something different. So and then and then the the interviewer asked him, you know, so what's the worst thing that could happen to you? And he said, if I become popular with the majority of the public. So, you know, getting that many likes, is that really the right community of people that you're looking judgment <coughs> from or mm. you're really value their opinions? Or you know, you can twist it on this head. So it's it's an open idea. Um, it's all it's 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 one hundred percent all open ideas. Um, yeah. I just want to kind of go back really quickly to what you were talking about with regards to funding, because we're now seeing murals, um, mural festivals particularly have that kind of really big knock-on effect for local economies. Do you think that 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 money can be used to fill a void that the arts guilds or uh, the government, any other sort of system, is failing to invest into? And should it have a, 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 a sort of a responsibility to invest back into yeah. that? I mean, I don't, I don't know too much about the street art kind of mural scene, but I think we have a moral responsibility as a society to fund the arts in some ways, otherwise we are just going to get into a situation where only rich children can really do art. I mean, that's mm. a shame, because then we wouldn't have people like Grayson Perry, we wouldn't have people like you know, um, Alexander McQueen or Bowie or any of those people. And like, you know, art is, you know, it's, it's born from different places. And so that's, we don't really remember that sometimes. Or I think we do, but because of housing prizes and all this stuff, you know, it gets, it just gets bleeded it, it out. It pays so. for itself as well, you know, like, uh, in- it brings a lot of money to- It, it does, I mean, I hate, well, I hate that yeah. argument. I hate saying defending arts funding on the basis that it's a good investment. Mm. I think there's something to be said, well, it's just, it's art for art's sake, and that's actually of benefit to society generally. But on the flip side, if you're gonna argue it from an economic perspective, it makes no sense. Like, Trump's on about cutting all arts, uh, national arts endowment funding. Like, the, it's been proven that in America, the public funding, uh, towards arts has a return on investment of 800%. Like, that's how much it gives back it's to the economy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, you think, you think exactly. That, as a businessman, yeah. you think he'd go, oh, well, that's good business. But no, yeah. it's it's not about money. It's but it's it's ideology. It's it's a clear ide ideological choice to cut arts funding. And you've got to ask, why is that? And I think it's because people like Trump and people like the alt-right are threatened by art because it's where critical voices come from and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so if they see us as a, th as a th be. well, they, they should, should be, be they should be threatened. But, but unfortunately, um, you can't shut them up. That's well, the that's, problem. That's, that's, that is. And that goes full circle. You can punch Trump, them. unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. but if they're threatened by that, then that tells me that there is some power in it and there is, some, there is a change. But when we are getting into that Nazi territory of, you know, like, because, you know, they were obviously getting rid of certain artists they didn't like. And, you know, and if Trump, I mean, it's funny because if you look at Trump's house, well, it's full of gold. It looks exactly like Saddam Hussein's house. All these other dictators have them covering gold, and they've got the same portraits. Um, and they, I, I guess they, it's funny, dictators like a lot of kind of watercolours and very realistic paintings. I don't know why all dictators like that kind of work, but 
Um, they tend to be snappy dressers, though. Trump fails there. <laughs> yeah, he really does. I mean, you look at Gaddafi, you know, yeah. Hitler, they could all, they could all dress. Yeah. I'll give them yeah. that. You know, yeah. they, they could dress. Uh, <laughs> but, I, you know, it's boring if you've got one person telling us to make all the same art, you know. Mm. You've got people like Ai, Ai Weiwei, who does what he does mm. amazingly, he's, he's, and, he's you know, yeah, there's lots of artists who do incredible things, and if it wasn't for those people, this is comment on society, isn't it, and what's going on, and that's how we understand some things, so it's really... I guess. Well, there was this wonderful group called Vaina, it's Russian, of course, but in 2010 they made a giant penis on the rising bridge. And it was off it because they were basically, I love that. Bit. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, it was basically, <laughs> they say Petersburg, they've got the rising bridges there because, you know, lots of water. And there was the FSB building, and it was all about, you know, it was because they were trying to repress freedom of speech. There was too much security, too much, you know, forbidden things going on, people being put in prison for speaking out. A little bit what Trump's trying to do now, but in a different way. And one of the rising bridges was just opposite the FSB building, and um, they, at night, they they basically drew this enormous penis. So when the trip went underneath it, the penis re you know, went up. <laughs> and it basically was the biggest fuck you that you could possibly have in, in the art world. I've, I've never heard of it. What happened after that is that this group got arrested, put in prison. They're still, you know, being, um, yes. they're still going, undergoing the criminal investigation. And Banksy bailed them out. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He does all that stuff <laughs> on the <laughs> radar that nobody knows. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like that. Look, uh, we are kind of we, we must be slowly coming towards uh, the end. Can we any 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 other questions? Uh, of course. Uh, well, you hosted. You, you've brought. Okay, so you go first, probably. <laughs> I have a question. Well, the whole point of this conversation tonight is going very well, guys. <laughs> Crazy idea. Um, but no, I'm really was interested in what you with your work, Anthony. And in terms of like, you've been a fine artist mm -hmm. and have showed with numerous galleries around the world and you have a very kind of, I would say, a very kind of contemporary art following, right? People that are a little bit more into fine art, contemporary art. And then you, out, out of nowhere, you came out with this Trump thing on the cigarette package, mm -hmm. right? Which went viral. I mean, people loved it all over the world. Spread. You tapped into something that people were obviously globally feeling. I used to make older work, which is very similar to that. Right, so the yeah. Trump imagery was just... A kind I of guess a, I was revisiting older stuff. Yeah, I, I think as an artist, you, you, know, you can sit and paint yourself all day or bowls of fruit, which is great and fun. But like, it's funny when something like Trump comes up, you just... I don't know, I think, you know... If, but did you see it that by doing that work that you attracted a whole different demographic to your artwork? Did you see your followers um, go up when you go back to talk about social media? Did you see the engagement? With well, your work you, you, extent because you, of that. You bring in different content. people. It's, I, I think Instagram, for example, is you know it's a platform where you have a sort of a, a conversation and like so if you post if you've got five hundred pictures of cats and then suddenly you post a dog, everyone's gonna get a bit weird. <laughs> and then it's a bit like if I post a picture of Trump, everyone's like, It's not you, because I pay myself well, I'm not an narcissist, I just pay for life. So I just do that. And and so but my older work was used to use all, all that, you know, same language, and like when, you know, when I was showing like Laz, uh, Lazaridis, um, like my older work, and uh, like, you know, in Bethlehem, was, was a lot to do with those kind of uh, similar style, do you know what I mean? So it's just, I, I guess I, I, I thought I was just revisiting older work and uh, older techniques, so, which I, I guess people who now know my newest work would not know that, so. Yeah. Did you feel though that you had a net, like, what was the objective? I mean, it Did felt you, quite you nice like, in a sense. It was a necessity for you as an artist yeah. to, do, to have some comment in this? Yeah, did you feel a responsibility? Stage? Was it a sort of a sense of responsibility as an artist? I, I, just think, I just think sometimes you just feel so angry about the situation. I mean, like, if I say anything, no one listens to me, but if I can make something, then I don't know, like, people will, I, I don't know if people look at it or not, but they, they looked at that, and that was great. And that, you know, well, you put it online to download for free, right? You can download yeah. the artwork for free. Which yeah. Is amazing. How many downloads have you had, and how, many, how much has that imagery spread globally? I've had 10,000 downloads in six days. Wow. That's cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I've seen pictures of someone, you know, on Instagram, like holding it up in Miami, like this. Is <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I just. I don't. I don't know. I don't want to assume too much, you know? Like, it's nice it's gone out there, so... 
do you have to find that you have to be quite careful then how you follow that up and how much chatter you then put out there into the public realm? Because you can have that kind of that point where you cross it and it's like, actually, hang yeah. on, maybe I'm delving. Artists can delve very much deeply into a world that they aren't necessarily always familiar with and risk something kind of maybe devaluing their original yeah statement. i mean it's funny because i spoke <clears> to a few friends about that i was like i don't want to be known as a cigarette guy you know <laughs> um but then i guess you know you just put in equal amounts of other you know effort into other works but it's something it's just something right now at this time i guess i just feel quite strongly about and so i i find myself coming up with other ideas and trying to play with that and just think is that is that a strong idea and sometimes like some days you're like this is amazing it's gonna be great and the next day you just think oh, it's rubbish you know so um and so you edit so you don't put out everything that's just you know i think it probably just, goes back to that relationship with the viewer as well and, and what they make of the artwork because it's so charged that you must be aware that by putting that out there it's going to elicit a response one way or the other so that's yeah i mean i'm careful i mean because I, I made a series of those but that's the only one i've released and i don't and I, you know i think it'll water down the image if i just keep releasing similar images you know I just think it's stronger and it's better just have that one thing mm -hmm. doing its job yeah. rather than just, you know. I mean, I, I find myself still making bits of work related to that, um, but I don't think it warrants an exhibition. An exhibition or, or a print run or, you know. Sometimes you can have thoughts and, mm. you know, you drop them down as an artist and that's okay. And I think the trouble with Instagram and all these things, people go, oh, you know, you can doodle on a piece of paper and post it and people go, it's not as good as your paintings. And you're like, <laughs> fucking doodle. You know, like I did on a bank note. I'm like, you know, on the back of a bank bill or whatever. And, and, and it's funny, you, you know, but like, um, so it's weird, but you just, I think, mean, just enjoy it, really. Just enjoy what do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go right here. You had a question before, and then we're going to start. Sort of Is some out. political art the equivalent of essentially punching a Nazi in the face in that it's divisive as it is. The people who agree with you will agree with you, the people who disagree with you disagree with you. How do you get that balance where you actually go out and make people think? I think some Banksy stuff has done it where there hasn't necessarily been an exact target. I think mm. Trump, I think it works out the fact that he's an egotistical maniac, so anything which makes him look stupid does its job, like the girl who did the portrait of him with the small penis. I, it's funny, I was thinking, like, what's the difference between propaganda and, and, and making art which is political? And I was thinking, you know, what, what's the difference? And I thought about this Trump image, is it propaganda? Because I think propaganda, you're telling someone, I think you should think this. And I think political art, like I said earlier, if you can have some sort of sense of empathy with it, or you're commenting on the situation rather than just saying, think this, because that's propaganda. I think the Trump work probably fits into the propaganda thing. Not that I'm proud of that, but I don't like the guy, so it's okay. <laughs> but but I, I think, it, you know, it's easy just to point the finger at someone or just go, this is shit or your shit. But I just think, it, you know, to, to, to have a bit more thought about it goes a long way in terms of making. I think Banksy's great at that, because he can just comment on the situation. And people bring to it their own, you know, that's why it's so... He was very quiet resonant, regarding right? Brexit. I feel like the art community was very quiet for Brexit. You know, uh, and it's a Shop lot... Shop run did a good pace. And Wolfram did Weirdly, because that, that kind of caught me out. That was very subtle and a, it was a nice piece by Shock, that one. But, but in general, I feel that... And, and I feel that it could have had a real impact on how... Things. I mean, maybe I'm just an optimist in that sense, but I think it could have had if 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 the if artists were a little bit more. I think it's really divisive, vocal. though. I think you'd have had a lot more walls coming down, and not because people want to sell it. People just been destroying them. Yeah, good. <laughs> Burn it all to the ground. <laughs> Wait, I think that's a pretty good place to end it. So can I get you just to put your hands together for Anthony J. One more time for Tina for putting this whole thing on.